All right. Uh, well, I want to welcome everyone. How to succeed with Enterprise Green focused on the integrative design category here. Um, this course is for one hour in continuing education units, GBCI, uh, AIBD, BPI, as well as uh, AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, um, and I am coming in to you here on behalf of the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute, celebrating 20 years this year. Very exciting about that. And this session is brought to you by one of our sponsors, uh, Mitsubishi Electric. Mitsubishi provides all your heating, cooling, and filtration needs all in one. Today's low load homes uh, require right sized equipment that most systems, especially gas fired, cannot meet. Mitsubishi has low load, high efficient heat pumps that dehumidify and cool in the summer and work in reverse in the winter. Going ductless also reduces costs and makes it easier to meet Energy Star 3 and heat certification. Ductless mini splits can now be hidden in many different ways to meet your client's needs, and ducted systems can be used as well. Uh, ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to ensure a beautiful space and can be retrofitted in to replace a furnace in an existing single or multi-family project. Also, you don't want to miss out their dry mode. Uh, set your system to the dry mode when cooling is not needed, uh, and that will help remove excess humidity like I am experiencing <laughs> right now <laughs> where I'm at. Uh, and then when it does get cold, and it will, hyperheat ensures an efficient heat delivery down to negative 13 degrees, and backup strip heaters can kick in during the rare but coldest of cold days in all climate zones. Uh, each room of a house can be customized comfort while still being all electric and energy efficient for clients with different needs and only heat and cool rooms as needed. Uh, Multifamily and commercial centralized variable refrigerant flow or VRF systems work great on large projects. They can serve holdings and VRF heat recovery technology permits for simultaneous cooling and heating. Uh, as this illustration depicts, sometimes the space needs different um, uh, heating and cooling needs as the sun sort of moves around. So go ahead and check out all that over at MitsubishiComfort.com. And then also a huge thanks to our second tier sponsor, uh, Niagara Conservation. Um, it's no surprise that uh, toilets are the uh, number one cause of high water bills, and yet they're a simple flush away. Uh, so using advanced uh, vacuum-assisted technology, um, these uh, devices get water down um, much faster, much more efficient. And we have glowing reviews from multifamily affordable housing renovation specialists who only use these because they reduce those water bills, which are going up significantly, uh, and they're much more durable and affordable. Uh, ADA approved as well with side handles when that is um, a consideration. So we're down to 0.8 gallons per flush uh, with a single flush, um, and you can avoid the hassle dual flush, which I know can become frustrating for many. Uh, the Nano does have a dual down to 0.5 gallons per flush if you really want to go advanced. And then they also have their 1.25 gallon per shower, a minute shower heads and their 0.5 gallon per minute aerators, all guaranteed to get you huge water savings uh, and um, uh, 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 apply for water sense certification on most of these as well. So check them out too. All right, so today we're going to be getting into design, and that's really, uh, it's very important, and enterprise is changing, and there's some differences to what you need to know when you're submitting an enterprise project under 2020 for the design aspect, uh, and so it's really important to get this right because it has to be done very early in the project, uh, and it can make a project much more successful, in our opinion. So uh, our hope is that you know, everyone can really put a lot more efforts and focus in the design stage because what we say and what we see in, in the real world is that the less effort you put into the design stage, the more effort you're gonna spend undoing things that have to be fixed during the pre-drywall, during the construction, during the final submission stage. The more you can throw into that design effort with your team, uh, the easier it's gonna make it. So I'm very excited to really be talking about this because we always wanna hit on that. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how LEED integrates into all that as well and how many aspects of the Enterprise Green Communities program now, especially under 2020 and the requirements, um, are uh, really good resources and tools you can use to get credit, because most of these are just credits, uh, within uh, the LEED Integrative Project Team section, IP. So option one, Integrative Project uh, Team, option two, Design Shred and then the brand new one for LEED, which is Train the Trades, and how all those connect. 
So uh, I'm going to um, now hand it off to uh, uh, our speaker here, Krista, and then and we're going to dive into some Q&A throughout the session. So Krista Egger, she's the Vice President of the National Initiative at Enterprise Community Partners, where she's able to blend her passion for social change and sustainability. With more than 15 years of experience leading energy efficiency and healthy housing initiatives with affordable housing stakeholders, Krista manages the enterprise national sustainability efforts. She leverages the Enterprise Green Communities Platform, Climate Disaster Response Work, Cultural Resilience Programming to deploy equitable climate change resilient solutions across the country. Uh, and this is, I believe, Chris's third time on and the second time this month because there's a lot happening soon. So we wanted to make sure we uh, got the awareness out to everyone. So Krista, welcome back again. Glad you could join us and please do take it away. Great. Thank you, Brett. I'm really glad to be here and um, with all of you all today as well. I'm going to pull up some slides here. Okay, great. So I'm, as Brett said, going to share with you some of the key practices of integrative design that we've built into our program. Um, and I'll be highlighting some of the mandatory and optional measures of that. But really, even though I'll be talking about this in the context of enterprise green communities, as Brett mentioned, you can apply this type of approach to any project um, you're working on, regardless of whether it's going for this certification, lead certification, or no certification at all. So we'll be covering some of these, um, some of these best practices. So I'm going to start out by giving you a little bit of an overview of the 2020 Green Communities Program, and then I'm going to dive right in and focus in on Category 1 integrative design. So for those of y'all who aren't familiar with Enterprise Green Communities, um, we're a program based at Enterprise Community Partners. So Enterprise Community Partners is a national nonprofit in the affordable housing space. We've been around almost 40 years now. We're based in Columbia, Maryland, and we advocate for policies promoting affordable housing. We develop programs like Green Communities promoting high quality affordable housing, and we deploy capital to actually get affordable housing financed and, and off the ground. Our Green Communities program has been around about 15 years now, and it's really setting a standard for what we really believe all affordable housing that's being built new or being substantially renovated in this country can achieve. And we've worked over the years to, um, to try to identify and then knock down the different barriers that exist for affordable housing to be built in a sustainable manner. Um, so that's our, our objectives for the program. And over the years, we've been successful in partnership with all of you in terms of having a tremendous impact across the country. All of the light blue or dark blue states that you see here have green communities um, certified hey, Chris, projects. Krista, sorry, um, for some yeah. reason, we're, we're only getting half of your screen or hmm. maybe it's just me. Is everyone else seeing the whole screen? <laughs> I'm wondering if you can zoom out um, on your PowerPoint. Okay, let's see here. Is this better, we could, Brett? We could do it. I think if we do it this way, um, and then you just pull up the control panel by clicking that up arrow on the top right there. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, down, just, oh, this? nope, see, it's that arrow pointing <laughs> upwards right below, I don't know what's happening now, it's it's um right next to the word macros, right to the right of it, like top kind of right, see that little arrow pointing up, it's a little black arrow, um, yes. yep, there we go, why don't we just do that, and that should work for now, so thank you. Okay, yeah, no, thanks for calling that out. Um, so these are the states where we've had impact and partnership with you guys. Um, the difference in color here, the dark blue states are the states that have um, statewide policies that either incentivize or require the use of green communities with their affordable housing finance. And over the years, we've updated and changed the standard 
Um, and so you can see the different covers of the standard versions here, starting back in 2004, then 2008, 2011, 2015. And in January of this year, we released the 2020 criteria, which I'll be sharing with you all about today. Um, and even though the, the specific content within the manual and the cover itself has changed over the years, these are the principles that have um, stayed consistent. So that we're ensuring that the Green Communities Program is a green building certification system that makes sense for the affordable housing sector in that it's achievable for all affordable housing development types. So whether that's new or rehab, single family, multifamily, that it's cost effective and proven, we're not um, delving into experimental techniques, that it's designed to deliver significant benefits, that it's technically sound and measurable and verifiable. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on this image, but just to say we spent um, almost two years developing the 2020 criteria through a series of um, stakeholder working groups, listening sessions, public comment periods. And um, in January of this year, the 2020 criteria was published on our website. And in October of this year, so just a couple of months now, we'll be transitioning so that any project that is starting its certification process with us um, after that date will need to use the 2020 criteria. Up until then, you can pick whether or not you'd like to use our 2015 or the 2020 version. And so all of the new material is encapsulated in this, uh, in this new program. And here's the picture of the cover for 2020. <clears throat> and the five themes that we were really emphasizing in this update were improving the approach to integrative design to better lift up the needs of the community, um, increasing options to lay out a path to zero energy so projects can be designed to be zero energy or zero carbon throughout the program, really amplifying our approach to healthy living, adjusting how we approach water, not just looking at conservation, but water quality also, and then really amplifying how we look at resilience. So. Those are the five themes that we're lifting up throughout the program. But what you see on your, the slide here are the, um, the image of eight different categories of the program, which um, I'll be focusing on the first one today. So our, cat, our first category, category one, is the one you see at 12 o'clock. It's integrative design. And then we move on to location and neighborhood fabric is about where your project's located, site improvements, it's about erosion control, landscaping, irrigation, et cetera water, then energy, materials, then healthy living environment. Category seven is one of our largest categories and includes a number of issues about how your design, construction, and operations decisions impact the health of people living in your property. And then we get to category eight, operations, maintenance, and resident engagement, which includes practices um, that ideally put what you determined in integrative design as your project priorities really into life of, of the building as a whole. So I'm going to switch sharing for just a moment so that you can actually see the material on our site um, so you know where to access these resources. Brett, can you see the full um, screen that I'm sharing now? Yeah, now it's working fine, yep. Okay, okay great. So if you go to this webpage, um, which is greencommunitiesonline.org, if you scroll down on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see this navigation bar. So you should pick your filters appropriately. So if you're new construction or substantial rehab or mod rehab, depending on which button you pick here, you'll see different criteria and show up. So pick what type of construction you have and then pick whether or not you're rural or urban. And um, then you'll see the appropriate criterion pop up. If you wanna see, the full requirements, you can click into these categories on the side here. And as you can see, I clicked on integrative design and now I can see the actual names of all the um, criteria that show up in this um, category. And then within each, there's a rationale that you can see here. Then there's requirement, then recommendations, and then there are resources which follow. So this is where you find the main content. If you click on the word checklist, you go to a checklist version of the criteria, which is just a shorter version, might be easier to manipulate 
um, in your project planning. There's an Excel version, a PDF version, and an online version here too. And then just two other things I wanted to show you here, and then we'll get into integrative design. Um, one of those things I wanted to show you is appendix. If you click on appendices, the first thing that will pop up here are some definitions of substantial and moderate rehab. That's important to check out, as well as definitions of what qualifies as a rural project here. So that should help. And then finally, um, what I'd like to highlight is this last link on this navigation bar on the right-hand side of the screen is templates or certification. And if you go to this page, you'll see hot links to the different files that you'd share with our team um, to enable our team to review a certification application for you. And um, this item right here, Criterion 1.1 Project Priority Survey Editable, is one thing that I'll be um, highlighting for you all today. So I wanted um, to lift those up for you. But let me go back to integrative design. And you can see in the header that we have here for this category that um, we say that a successful integrative design process engages people, identifies collective priorities, and ensures that sustainability, health, resilience, and placemaking objectives are met. So this is really a process-based category, right? It's not telling you you have to install this material or you have to use this type of construction technique. This is really just about ensuring that um, the design of the project and the specs of the project are really co-developed. So I'm gonna go back to my slides for just a second here and um, talk a little bit more about about integrative design. So um, integrative design is, is difficult to do. It's challenging. It, it really requires approaching the project in a way that resists the silos in which design and construction often happen. Integrative design is more than coordinated design. It's more than just ensuring the ductwork and the electrical aren't going to be um, competing with one another. It's really ensuring that people work collaboratively together to determine what kind of impact they want the project to have, right? Um, buildings are so complex and we're not able to understand the full picture or the full impacts of a project unless we consider these disparate parts really together. So they're not glued on separate elements. It's really an integrative um, process. And what I have on this slide here are just a couple of awesome resources that you might want to check out after today's session. Um, for instance, at the bottom right, there's a logo for the Lean Construction Institute. Um, they're an organization that's focused on reintegrating the siloed construction in industry and have a lot of awesome resources there available for you to check out about how to approach an integrative design process. Then on the bottom left of that slide, there's just a highlight, a, a screen grab from the AIA. Um, they have an amazing integrative project delivery guide, which can be really helpful in identifying the different roles that different folks on the design team can have to really take an integrative approach. And when I say design team, it's not your typical architect leading the process necessarily. It's really a co-development process with owners, designers, builders, residents, operators, and more um, to make sure that you're not leaving anything off the table. And then right above that, I've got the logo for Regenesis. Um, you all may be familiar with this firm, but it's just, I've been so inspired by their work. Bill Reed is one of the principals there. And, He's really one of the godfathers of the integrative design process in the green building world. Um, Regenesis is a firm of thought leaders um, who are interested in transforming the development industry to one that can contribute to the health of the planet. And they have an amazing section of their website about resources for this type of approach. And then finally, over on the top right, there's a screen grab from Design Matters, which is an enterprise resource from our design shop. Um, and it includes three different um, components of a Design Matters toolkit. The first one is a project mission writer. The second one is a design principles primer. So for folks in the 
housing industry or the housing finance industry who want to get a firmer grasp on um, what aspects of design are available to them, that's a really useful tool. And then the third piece of that Design Matters Toolkit is an impact measurement guide. So these are some resources that can be really useful to you as you start trying to think about like, how can you approach your project in a maybe different way than you have in the past to ensure that it's um, coordinated and truly, um, truly integrative. So um, this category, integrative design, has been the first category in the Green Communities criteria since the very beginning. And I pulled a quote here from Alistair Jackson, who's with O'Brien and Company out in the Pacific Northwest, who was on our um, 2020 criteria and 2015 criteria technical working group and was focused on helping us update the section um, both times. And this quote that, that he shared here was that in 2015, we set some bold goals for this section of integrative design and implemented a set of strategies to achieve it. But for 2020, we really looked at outcomes, reviewed and revised the goals and listened to feedback from users and stakeholders so that um, the intention of this new criteria and really get the heart of the matter with a cleaner, more direct benefit for typical project delivery, with hopefully better outcomes through greater participation. So what you can see now on your screen are the different criteria in our older version, 2015, laid against our current version, the 2020. The lines that are gray are the ones that are mandatory and the ones that aren't gray are optional. And what you can see in 2015, we had two mandatory ones up front about goal setting and then criteria documentation, which are pretty broad and asking teams to self-select some goals for their project and determine and share with us how they developed them and how they were gonna measure them over time. Then we, the other two mandatory ones we had for 2015 um, was one was about health and one was about climate disaster resilience. And within both of those project teams were instructed to follow a process of identifying what the most um, prevalent priorities were for their project with health or resilience, and then pick an optional criterion somewhere else in our program that would correspond with that. Um, and we found a lot of success with that approach with 2015 in that the health and the climate disaster resilience information was going to be um, informed by data before project teams picked design decisions. But what we were really aiming for with 2020 was not to silo out health and resilience from the overall sustainability goals any longer, and to really ground the whole um, uh, design setting or goal setting process in the needs of communities and the people who are gonna be really impacted most by the property that's being developed. So with 2020, the first item that you see here that is mandatory is this project priorities survey approach. And then we have three mandatory ones that follow about really bringing that to life, um, putting that into action through charrettes and coordination meetings, through documentation of what's um, been determined as the project priorities in plans and specs, and then in construction management, which includes training of um, trades and, and contractors. And then there are three optional measures, one about health, one about resilience, and one about cultural resilience. But I'm gonna dive into this first one, project priority survey, um, for a couple of minutes. So the goal with this project priority survey was really to still have the integrative design process grounded in data, be data informed about the characteristics of the site and the community that you're building for, but really tie it all together so that all of this information is just in one place with the goal of when the project priority survey is completed, you the project team has a better understanding of the context, population, and environmental considerations that their development must address in order um, to move forward uh, successfully. So, the project priority survey has these six different sections. The first three are about residents and about who you're serving with the property. And then the fourth is about building emissions and then environmental resilience and then writing a project mission. So in the first section um, about resident expert experience, um, we're looking to understand more about what the needs and desires are from the people who will be living in the property once it's complete. And I'm actually gonna bring up and show you 
the project priority survey itself online. So if you go to the templates per certification link that I showed you a minute earlier on this website, you'll be brought to this um, integrated design project priority survey. I've just got it pulled up um, in advance here on a different tab. So um, the first section here is identify populations served. So you can check as many boxes as you want here that are relevant um, to identify what accommodations uh, different folks who are gonna be living in your property may have um, before you get started. And then we get into the section on resident expert experience. And so this is asking the project team to have a conversation with residents, if it's a rehab or potential residents, if it's new construction or other local stakeholders and community members um, to find out a little bit more about what's important to them um, in the property. So this is asking you to talk with those folks as well as um, folks involved with building management or resident services. So the sections of this element um, start with community reflection and understanding. So really asking more about who this development serves, what challenges and opportunities the people you serve are facing, what's the root cause of those, um, what are some of the assets or community resources the community has identified that they use to overcome any challenges that they're facing, and then identify some ideas for opportunities for ongoing uh, resident leadership and the design and development of this project. Our team on the certification side is not gonna be judging whether your answers are right or wrong or are necessarily responding to the community in the right way. What we're looking for is that you are responding to um, community need. So as you go to this next section on ground truthing, it gives you some advice about different ways to engage with the community through surveys or interviews, focus groups, et cetera. Um, and then ultimately to describe how your approach um, to design and, and development will be informed by this information you've gathered. So what we're, what we're trying to do here is, is not necessarily ask what residents want from a building in terms of specific amenities, like do you want a community garden or do you want a swimming pool or whatever else it may be. Instead, it's really learning more from the residents or I should say the impact of community what they want from their community. Like what kind of relationship do they want with the place that they'll be living and with the people that they'll be neighbors with and the place where, they're, where they will really be establishing their lives. And then with that information, then you as a housing design and or development professional can really start to identify how the design and operations decisions that you're making with the building can contribute to solving for that type of relationship and goals that the community really identified was the priority for them. You know, every decision that we make in design and development will impact the community. And this is just a process to help guide you in um, having information about really what type of relationship matters to the folks you'll be serving so that the decisions you're making can be more intentionally responsive to that. Um, so the other sections of this project priority survey um, have to do with health and emissions and resilience. So with this identify resident opportunity factors, you'll go to the Opportunity 360 tool, which is a free tool that's easy to access um, that pulls data on the census tract level from across the country from national data sources and will provide information about health and education and economic mobility and other aspects of a community that you can use to inform your understanding of where you're building. Then this next section about building, understanding building emissions is just guiding you through how far do you wanna take um, the path to net zero with your project. And then this next section about climate and environmental resilience gives you a couple of resources here, um, lifting up Flash and um, Climate Central here for you to identify what are some hazards, as you see listed here on the side, that are applicable to your project and are high, medium, or low risk? 
and all of that then comes together in just one place here um, to ground how you're approaching your project based in community identified needs and desires with information about how as a project team collectively you want to approach emissions and health and resilience and then gives you some guidance about writing a project mission statement. There are some examples here. There are some resources to use in developing it here. It doesn't need to be long, um, but it, this is just really centering your project um, with all of this information in one place. So I'm gonna go back to the slides now and, um, and kind of wrap up that first bit on the project priority survey to hopefully have hopefully I've given you a glimpse into what's included there, why it's important, how you can approach it, and you know recognize that the first section about getting input from the impacted community doesn't necessarily have to happen first in a linear fashion. You may um, have already identified times to engage with the community and once you want to add a few extra questions from this survey, for instance, and, and that's fine. Um, you might want to engage folks in some of the later sections of the Project Priority Survey about energy and resilience in a creative way. That's that's fine. It doesn't have to be filled out linearly. And I'd advise, I would advise you not to let the um, implication of engaging with the community in a different way have that stop you in your tracks um, before you move on um, to the other sections. So we're really excited about what um, that information will be able to provide to really set project teams off on the right footing um, with a holistic approach to integrative design. So with that, I'm just going to share a couple of highlights about the other measures that are in this category and then um, have kind of a back and forth with Brett here about how the information in green communities with some of these other uh, criterion also relates to LEED. So the three other mandatory measures in the 2020 criteria, category one, integrative design, are the ones that are listed in orange on your screen here. The first one here about charrettes and coordination meetings is about moving that project mission and grounding information from the project priority survey into action. So this is asking you to take a collaborative process then in um, in identifying what different multi-benefit strategies that you want to include in your project. Like how are you going to address heating and cooling in a way that makes sense with your other objectives in your project, for instance. And um, through charrettes and coordination meetings, start to assign some accountability for whom in the construction delivery process will be responsible for the different aspects. And then 1.3, which is the next mandatory one here, is about documentation. So after you've spent all of this time and good work identifying what your goals are, then how you're going to meet them with different design and construction strategies, this 1.3 documentation is about ensuring that those actually get memorialized in the project plans and specs. So this will um, include information in the con construction and contract documents needed to properly implement your goals and um, asking you to document this type of information in Division I, Section 018113, the sustainable design requirements of your specs. And then the last mandatory one here about integrative design is, construct is called construction management. And this one is really all about identifying the goals and roles for the different folks involved in construction. So what kind of um, roles will the different trades have what goals are you setting for them? How will they be interacting with other folks who are involved in the construction process? Um, how will they be trained um, to make sure that they're set up for success? And then the last three items in this category one are optional and they provide teams who are interested to really go the extra mile in amplifying the impacts that the project will have on either the health of the residents by going through a health action plan process and working with a public health professional or amplifying the climate disaster resilience that the project will have through 1.6 in doing a multi-hazard risk or vulnerability assessment. And then the last one here is about strengthening cultural resilience. So either by doing a, a cultural um, resilience audit or by pulling together a cultural resilience advisory board 
to really identify what the community is recognizing are the critical aspects with how they relate to one another that can be strengthened in the project um, throughout the rest of its useful life. So Brett, I think I'll stop there and see what kind of conversation we wanna get into now about um, how these relate to other measures and lead. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Krista. And um, so, yeah, we've got plenty of time to have some dialogue and, and conversation, and I've got some more things that hopefully I can go through here. But I do want to give everyone a chance really to get their questions and concerns answered on this project priorities piece, just because it is, you know, so new um, as far as what folks need to do. Um, so there was one question that did come in, and I'm going to just kind of um, I'm going to add to it a little bit and expand upon it. I think it's a really good question. I think it was kind of getting at the heart of, um, you know, kind of getting a sense uh, for the backgrounds of your, uh, you know, your tenants, your occupants, the community, so you can better serve them. So just mm -hmm. from a diversity standpoint, um, you know, from a, a race standpoint, obviously income, that's one thing that you're focused on that, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe from profession or, you know, are they LGBTQ or, you know, whatever, what is important about collecting that information and how can you use it to help, um, you know, serve the occupants better in the context of enterprise? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, what I was mentioning earlier about not necessarily asking residents like what design features they really want in their building, but getting an idea from them about what kind of relationship they want to have with their neighbors and what kind of relationship do they want to have with the place that they're living, mm -hmm. really be informed by some of those characteristics, right? So um, we've worked with some amazing affordable housing projects that are designed to serve the LGBTQ um, a community in the Pacific Northwest and in San Francisco. I'm thinking of two specific examples right now, just in, in those locations, who were um, able to, to really amplify and respond to the needs of that particular population by how they designed the building, um, mm -hmm. by what different services they were offering, by um, by including different design features that really responded to the project um, residents' needs as well. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can actually follow up with you, Brett, by sending you some links to some case studies about those projects that you can see, you can see the response um, better than I'm gonna be able to describe it right now. But also if you're, for instance, serving a, a building uh, with seniors, you know, their needs are likely going to be different in terms of mobility than mm. um, a family building. So you may be paying more attention to um, visitability and accessibility there and, and aging in place. Um, so it's it's really about understanding more about the characteristics and priorities of the people <laughs> and how they wanna live um, mm. so that you can determine what different design solutions can you offer that respond to that. Um, so another question that came in, uh, they use the term small project, but I guess even thinking, is this something that's applicable to your your single family projects? How does that work? Um, yes, I think it still would apply to the single family project because th okay. this is still just about identifying what the, the needs of the people who are going to live there, whether mm -hmm. or not it's multifamily, single family, rehab, new construction. You know, I think... Um, within the project priority survey, you know, identifying what uh, climate disasters are more likely to strike your project is just as relevant with single family versus multifamily. Um, sure. and, and looking at the different health needs that the folks who are going to live there is, is really important too. And, you know, if, if you don't have an idea of exactly who is going to live in your building yet, you may, you likely do though, have some idea of some general characteristics um, and being able to talk to folks who um, have have those in common with the people who will likely be living in your building is the community that you can go to in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned, yeah, I'm glad you brought up new construction because I'm trying to imagine 
how do you survey people who aren't there yet, right? That the building's not there yet. So what strategies do you recommend on the new construction side? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the question we would pose back is um, how can you gather information from a community that has similar characteristics to the one that you'll be impacting? Um, one example I can give is a couple of years ago, we were working with an affordable housing developer in Chicago who was actually going through almost an early iteration of this project priority survey with us on a new mm -hmm. construction project. And they were planning on building that new construction project in proximity to where they managed several affordable housing buildings already. Mm -hmm. And they were all going to be housing seniors and they were all going to likely um, uh, be of the same um, uh, heritage. And so they pulled together focus groups of those mm -hmm. existing buildings in the neighborhood that they managed to get mm -hmm. input from those people um, that then informed how they designed their new construction project. So that's that's one way of thinking about it. Okay. Or somebody who does sort of replicated projects across wherever the state or the region could just utilize, I suspect, one of their other projects, right? I mean, yeah. It yeah. could be one strategy, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so one concern that I, uh, you know, I, I could imagine then is, you know, these projects who are using enterprise, you know, they're applying for, um, you know, low income housing tax credit funding or USDA funding or maybe HUD. And a lot of times they sort of get an idea of what they're going to do, but it's not like, you know, until they know they have the funds, then it's like, all right, now we need to be ready to go yesterday, right? It's always a panic, a mad rush. And the idea that you would say, well, hey, you know, now there's this priorities and you've got to survey your residents, but you're also scrambling to start building the building because you just got funded. It doesn't really jive very well in that conversation. Um, so what recommendations do you have for folks who are, you know, technical assistance providers or consultants who kind of get stuck in the middle of this conversation, right? Uh, who are saying, oh, now you got to do this priority, but you're also trying to, you know, ram forward on the construction and design, and you're, so you're probably not really listening anymore. Uh, what, I mean, what suggestions do you have there? Yeah, it's a it's a really legitimate question. I think um, holding the resident input part of the project parties survey aside for a second, the rest of that could be done by a consultant mm -hmm. or by an architect or by a developer. Mm -hmm. um, in an hour, you know, okay. without paying a consultant. Um, it could be done as early in the process as they think to do it, or it could be done late. It, it doesn't require an investment of time or, or money to get it done. Mm -hmm. And we strongly believe that it will help really inform um, the priorities of, of your project moving forward. The resident input part does take time and coordination, you know, to right. identify who you want to talk to, how you want to ask them questions, what questions you're going to ask, and what you're going to do with it later. But you know, with this, with in the industry or within the sector of affordable housing, I think we all are really in this to design high-quality homes for people to live in for um, decades to come. You know, and spending a little bit more time on the front end of getting that mm -hmm. resident input will pay off in the long run um, in terms of tenant satisfaction and we're anticipating um, you know, lower turnover rates and, and whatnot. So it, mm -hmm. it will, you know, taking a, an authentic approach to integrative design does make design take longer. <laughs> but mm -hmm. as you said in your intro, Brett, <laughs> you know, it reduces problems later, in the later down the road. We've also seen that it can reduce costs because you're hmm. actually thinking about this as an integrative process, not an add-on on process. Right, right. So um, it's making me think that maybe a strategy could be just getting the word out to these developers, like, hey, build into your process sort of an ongoing survey feedback information that you're constantly getting from your stakeholders so that when you go to do a project, you're ready to go. It, it, does that seem like a good strategy? Have you seen any successful examples of that that you can briefly talk about or, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that sounds like a great strategy. And, you know, most affordable housing development teams are getting community 
um, input before they get funded too, you know, <laughs> whether sure. it's looking at changes in zoning ordinances or it's getting just community buy-in for, um, mm. for different aspects of uh, having this property in a certain community. Mm. So there are likely opportunities mm. to connect with the community already, but mm -hmm. how can you add an extra question, for instance, into those opportunities that you already have set up to get sure. more of this type of information. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I don't see any questions from anyone on the project priorities piece, but um, we still have some more time for discussion. So if anyone wants to bring that back up, I think uh, by all means, you know, send it out and we'll come back onto it. I will say from a lead perspective, it's interesting, the project priorities piece um, unless there's an innovation credit, and, and some of you on this call probably know more than me. I see who you, you know, I see you guys smart, a lot smarter people than me on here, uh, as far as lead goes. And um, so maybe you can chime in if you know of an innovation credit that connects with project priorities. But I don't really know of one. But I do was thinking as you were talking, I was thinking of lead existing, um, or I guess it's now lead operation and maintenance O and M. And I really see something like this being beneficial in that aspect because it's really getting a sense of what's going on with your residents um, and then putting a plan in place to reduce your emissions, improve your health, get them better mobility uh, that's not car related. So uh, just making a just a, an observation based on what I know about O&M and seeing how that could be a really great resource uh, along with ARC and all the other tools um, that they allow uh, out there. But otherwise I didn't see any other specific connections there. Um, but as far as your other pieces go, so I'm looking at your integrative design, um, charrettes and coordination meetings 1.2, and I'm really seeing the, the sort of um, connection between a portion of the integrative project team. So there's three parts to integrative project team. There's sort of the get the team together, identify who they are. Um, and then there is the, the ongoing meetings with them through certain phases of construction. Um, and then there is another part of it, which we'll get into in a second, that I think coordinates better with one of your other credits. And then, of course, there's the lead design charrette. Everyone knows the lead design charrette. Um, it's always you know discussed. It's not always used, but it's always discussed. Um, and so I really see this charrettes and coordination meeting aspect really connecting with these two and helping give some resources to do that. Um, you know, what's, I guess, you know, briefly, you know, new and different, um, you know, with, with this item and, you know, some ways people can be successful here. Yeah, it's a great question. For green communities, what's new and different is being a little bit more prescriptive about the process. You mm -hmm. know, in 2015, we said, set goals collaboratively. Mm -hmm. and tell us what they are and tell us how you're going to follow through with them and who is involved in setting them like those mm -hmm. were the three questions with um with 2020 we're we're pushing the envelope just a little bit more <laughs> to say and tell us exactly really how you are going to follow through with these over, mm -hmm. over time in terms of um identifying the people who are going to be accountable for different measures and um taking some time to identify different multi-benefit strategies, et cetera. And if, if you go to our criteria site and look at the full requirements, we have different bullet points about um, using the process to like productively and regularly engage residents or community members, include lessons learned from existing projects, et cetera. Um, but this is, this is really to confirm that the green objectives for the project are incorporated into this design. So going back to that quote I pulled from Alistair, a little bit earlier is where we are really uh, getting into the area a, a little bit more now of project delivery rather than um, just just goal setting. Um, great, and if anyone has any questions on those items, um, we'd love to hear hear any of your thoughts on how to be more successful um, on the Charette side. Um, didn't see any just yet, but feel free, please do chime in. This is the Q&A portion, so please do chime in. So um, the next one I'm looking at is design documentation um, or integrative design documentation. And, and this clearly actually jumping out of the integrated process section of Lead for Homes and jumping into the innovation design or ID section, the preliminary rating, right? It's 
you should you should in the design stage it's pretty straightforward you should know what credits you are going after now one of the big differences between lead and enterprise is that you know gbci from the home's perspective anyway is not looking for you to uh, communicate with them on what you're going after in the early design stage before you start construction. So it's really the onus falls on the green raiders and the providers to really be ensuring their teams are all in agreement with what they're going after and that they're you know working strategically to achieve those outcomes. Um, so, but in your case with enterprise, for those of you who, who may not know, you do have an actual submission process that requires you to you know verify that you're on track during before construction starts so i guess um you know how does that tie into documentation and you know kind of what's new and different there within 2020 yeah it's a it's a great point um about just highlighting how the um pre-build section of green communities for instance really really does ask for some specific some specificity about how you'll be moving forward. It's fine if changes are made, you know, between that pre-build stage and the post-build stage. But, um, you know, in the affordable housing sector where budgets are so thin, <laughs> margins are razor thin, we're really just emphasizing how important it is to set yourself up for success before you start purchasing any materials, <laughs> before you start sending, sending people out on site. Um, so, what's what's new and different with 2020 here about um this criterion is asking teams to include their criteria information that preliminary pre-build checklist in their construction specs um so we had not explicitly made that link before as you were saying our team our certification staff was seeing that information but it, it wasn't clear whether or not um the construction team was seeing that information and i think just being able to really clearly set those goals for the people who are involved in the project so that they have a chance to meet them <laughs> rather than guess at meeting them is is a is a um, new addition for us here um one thing i just thought of i you know i've always really appreciated the um that 2015 uh um specs document you all put together to really kind of take out the guesswork yeah. um is that still pretty good for 2020 are you coming up with a 2020 version can we encourage you to come up with one i mean a lot of teams see it and they find it pretty helpful which seems to go really along with in line with helping with this 1.3 yeah that's great that's great feedback yeah i think in some ways it would still be relevant but it's not the 2015 version of the specs it doesn't include everything that's in 2020. You know, um, when we were looking at the different resources on our website that we had produced for 2015 and deciding which ones we should update for 2020, that one actually didn't come up high on the list in terms of numbers of downloads. <laughs> so we didn't prioritize it as much to update as some of the others. But um, I'm, I'll put your your name in that column, Brett, and um, see what other feedback that we can get from stakeholders about um, prioritizing the development of that. Great, and a question came in, uh, obviously on everybody's mind. Um, you know, obviously you, you wrote 2020 pre-pandemic era, uh, and it came out in the middle of it, but um, what resources, recommendations, or if any requirements now, are embedded or might be embedded in 2020 as far as you know addressing COVID-19? Yeah, it's a really good question. And you're right, we produced it before pandemic was on anyone's minds. Um, but you know, there are features within the program that are mandatory that I think are really critical strategies um, in, in light of COVID. So for instance, the requirement for mechanical ventilation for new and substantial rehab projects, um, the location and proximity to amenities, I think is key in ensuring that folks don't have to rely on, um, um, on, let's see, don't have to guess or have difficulty in accessing the services and amenities that they need. Um, we are smoke-free policy in 2020 is more stringent than it has been before and there's data and evidence showing that 
um, smoking rates are tied to higher rates of, of COVID. And so I think that's an important criterion to have. And, and there are, are many others um, related to indoor air quality that we are proud of even more now <laughs> knowing how important they are in, in light of COVID than before. When the one change that we've made to our criterion post COVID was expanding use of one of our new criterion about access to broadband, which when we wrote it, it was only geared towards rural projects, but now we've opened it up nationally because you know access to the internet is key no matter where you're located in the country now, whether it's um, whether or not you're using it for access to telemedicine or you're using it for work or you're using it for your kids in school um, or ordering groceries online, whatever it may be. So um, that digital divide is something that I think we're all realizing is something that really needs to be, that gap of the digital divide needs to be closed. Um, so that's one change that we've made to our program since then. Great, thank you. Um, and again, please, anyone, any questions, comments, um, love to have hear you. Um, sort of the last one here, you know, obviously you've, and I like how you've set it up, you know, you've you've started way before the project, getting the priorities figured out, and then you put the team together, having those meetings, those charrettes, um, really intentional design, and then you document it. And of course, now the construction is beginning and, you know, the communication and the education really at that point, you know, shouldn't end. Um, and that's something we try to strive for too on lead projects. So, you know, it, it's the integrative project team actually sort of the, the credit option one spans into this section too, if you read it really closely. There's a piece in there that of course, once you've gotten all your, you know, diverse stakeholders together from the team, architect, builder, HVAC, you know, you name it. And then you've got them meeting throughout certain phases of design. Once construction starts, there is a requirement that there is this ongoing, for the credit anyway, it's a credit, ongoing communication between everyone on the team um, and, and the rater and just making sure everything's on track and nothing gets, um, you know, off track during construction. And it's been a very useful tool that I've seen in practice, you know, uh, if anything, prevent certification from happening um, or, you know, just from loss of credits and so, or just having a better built, more sustainable project. So really having those communications going out. And then from the trades training standpoint, you know, obviously LEED provides very specific training on the site for the actual project for the trades that has to do with, you know, technical details, not just overarching ideas. So tell me a little bit more about construction management process, which, you know, I believe is fairly new within this program, you know, briefly, and, and, and does it require actual technical training of the contractors or is it more just sort of broad education? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So it is the first time that we've specifically called this out in requirements for green communities. So um, we've, in some ways, we're standing on the shoulders of project teams who've gone through LEAD and other programs in this regard um, before, but at, at its core, what this is about is ensuring that the trades understand what their success is being evaluated upon, right? So with an insulation contractor, for instance, it's not just about ensuring that you have insulation in all the wall sections by this particular date. It's also ensuring that you don't have any gaps or compression or voids, right? That the insulation is installed in a way that it'll that'll work properly. So that would that would be the, the goal, right? Of, that's what success of that insulation contractor will likely be judged upon. And it's important to make that really clear up front. So um, we we don't have um, a lot of specific guidelines about all of the different elements which must be included in a training program. Instead, we're really um, relying on the project team to make the best decisions in that regard as, as long as it is about focusing on what the responsibilities of the involved parties will be and how their work will be evaluated. Um, and if you go to that criteria website, we have more information you know, about requirements, recommendations, resources, but at, at its crux, that's, that's what it's about. So that there's no question about um, whether or not, um, what direction to go in to achieve success. It's laid out in the beginning. 
Um, well, we're at our time. I want to be respectful, everyone. Do you, Krista, do you still have time to stick around for some sure. more questions, though? OK, yeah. great. Um, before we get to those, I just wanted to real quick um, remind everyone, if you're looking for your CEUs, um, right when we close out, it'll pop up. Um, if you have to go or you want or you miss it, uh, check it. It'll come to your email an hour later. Do take that survey. We really appreciate it, even if you don't need CEUs. And for those of you watching this in the future on demand, please take that quiz with an 80% passing rate. Um, if you're doing this on our YouTube channel, you can click on the YouTube button. And then on the bottom left there, you can click show more. Uh, and then underneath on the top right there, you'll see that there is a link to go to our website to start taking quiz. And real quick, just a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, and then our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, Ream, and Build Equinox. Thanks to all of them who allow us to do um, what we do. Um, so a uh, question coming in, what role do the contractors play in the integrative design process? How early should the GC be brought on? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, you know, the easy answer to how early should the GC be brought on is as early as possible, right? But, um, but I know sometimes you're not a, like, depending on your funding constraints, you might be required to um, put out a bid for general contractors after a certain period of time, um, you know, not until after you've gotten your your funding. But um, it it is, let's see, you know, how I was describing integrative design at the beginning in terms of it being a complex process and trying to de-silo the different segments of of development. You know, the more voices that you have at the table who speak from different perspectives, the more successful the integrative design process will be. So um, if you can get that general contractor on early to answer a couple of key questions, um, that that would be um, ideal. And as far as what role the trade should play in the integrative design process, in an ideal world, that you know, they would be at the table. Um, you, I was in a design threat years ago where, um, the team was discussing some uh, a priority of having very efficient HVAC equipment, and they were zeroing in on a particular type of, of system to use for the project. Um, and then uh, a property, I think a mechanical um, contractor who had done work on other buildings for that owner, came around to the table and spoke up and said that he wasn't able to, to purchase the type of filter <laughs> the six inch pleated filter media filter that was required for that particular system um, from the normal um, procurement process that they went through. And so, you know, that was really valuable information and they went a slightly different direction and ended up using a different system that could be maintained well over time. So those are the types of nuggets of wisdom <laughs> that you'll be able to really get the more voices that you do, you do have at the table. Yeah, great. Um, and then changing gears a little bit here, can you talk a little bit about with the enterprise program um, on how you deal with, uh, I believe, what they're looking at is um, maybe mixed income developments. Uh, are those still allowed under enterprise? Yeah, it's a great question. They they are. Um, in the early days of green communities, we had um, strict percentages of numbers of units in the property or percentage of units in the property that had to meet certain affordability thresholds. And now the minimum is just at least, at least one dwelling unit in the building must, um, must have affordability restrictions. So if you go to our webpage, which is that first link you've got pulled up here, Brett, that enterprisecommunity.org slash green, you can scroll down about two thirds of the way down the page and click on a link that says eligibility instructions. And it has more details there, but Mixed income and mixed use are fine um, as long as there is a component of long-term affordability restrictions on at least a unit in the project. Um, what do you do with projects? Um, so I know some of the state affordable housing agencies, um, you know, if you lump in um, a commercial spot that's, you know, detached from the larger development um, and it's a standalone, a lot of them will still require that they pursue green certification uh, somehow. 
Um, do you all allow your program to uh, apply to non-residential space? And I know you do when it's mixed use, but when it's what happens when it's detached, but part of, part of a larger LIHTC, you know, um, uh, development? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, many of our requirements in the program can apply to buildings regardless of whether they're residential or commercial, right? Where um, the limiting factor is in some regards is our energy efficiency guidelines, which are really designed for residential projects. So we're not always able to um, apply all of the requirements in our program to commercial spaces in a project because of different commercial systems a restaurant may have or 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 whatnot. Um, but otherwise, the other measures in the program often can and should be applied to those commercial spaces. You know, whether you're talking about material purchasing or whether you're looking at water conservation or whether you're looking at uh, design techniques. Um, well, Krista, this has been great, great conversation. I don't see any more questions and we're a little bit over our time, which usually does happen. Um, so I guess real quick, just can you remind us when that deadline is for folks to start 2020 versus 2015? And then where can people go to find, you know, more resources to learn more? Yeah, definitely. So you can start using 2020 now <laughs> if you'd like. Um, after October 15th of this year, um, when you um, look to submit a project for pre-build for the first time, you'll only be able to use the 2020 criteria. So if you've submitted a project already with our 2015 criteria and for whatever reason it wasn't approved, we needed more information to figure out how something was in compliance or not, that one will still be able to work with 2015, you know, even though it might not be approved yet because you've submitted it at least once. <laughs> um, but for submitting for the first time a project, um, uh, you have um, after October 15th, you'll only be able to use the 2020 criteria. And if you go to the links that you see on your screen here, you can find out a lot more information about the program. If you go to that first link, you'll also see registration buttons for longer workshops that we're having in different parts of the country. Um, you'll find links to the eligibility information about the program, an ambassador guide that you can use, um, comparisons between our 2015 and 2020 program, Upcoming comparisons should be there not too long, comparing LEED v4 and 4.1 to 2020 criteria, all sorts of great information. If you just want to go to the criteria, you can go straight to the Green Communities online link. Um, so lots of great information there, and please reach out to us at certification at enterprisecommunity.org uh, with any question you have. We'd love to work with you all um, through your next project. Oh, and actually, it jarred my memory. I remember when 2015 came out, uh, I went to a great event in Detroit, um, really fantastic, kind of covering the program. Obviously, it's not, you said you should, you're doing some workshops uh, in person, or maybe, maybe, I don't well, know if you mentioned it or not, but are you doing any virtual 2020 workshops, I guess? Yeah, we are. And I think I may have said we're doing them in different parts of the country, but they're all online. You know, they're all on Zoom. Um, but we are doing different ones targeted to different locations so that we can, you know, get into the nitty gritty of like dehumidification in New Orleans, but maybe not talk about that when we're in the Arizona desert. You know, um, so it. yeah, okay. if, you, if you go to that um, first link you see here, yeah. we have several registrations that are open right now. Um, some are just one hour overviews and others are three hour sessions that have a lot of breakout rooms and interactive exercises to get yeah. um, comfortable with the material. Well, uh, Krista, thank you again for joining us. Um, and thanks again for um, Enterprise Community Partners for having you out here. And just before we wrap up again, just everyone, we wanna see you all in person, hopefully in 2021. Um, so stay safe out there wear your mask, stay in if you can, stay away, and you know, help us get the word out about building science, being able to play a huge role in stopping all things in the air that we don't wanna be breathing. So take care everyone, have a great rest of your week, and thank you so much, goodbye.